<laughs> this talk is about today. Um, okay, Alex is recording, I guess. Yes. Uh, this talk will be recorded for further use on the homepage of, from the Risk um, Institute. And Bruno is talking about about the power of nuclear and the high is it a high risk technology or what happens if risk communication fails? One requires or one question Bruno asked me, um, if you leave your videos on, he would highly appreciate this because it's much easier to communicate or see at least your faces when he's talking, not to a black screen. Thanks very much for listening. And, the, and if you've got questions, we will have them later. And I would encourage you to uh, mood yourself, despite you have some questions, so that them noises can be um, cannot be heard. Someone, so thank you very much. Hope hope this is clear for now. Bruno, it's your turn. Yes, yes, I'm just playing. I'm just opening and just about sharing the screen, but I wanted to share the screen at the right end and not in the middle of the presentation. This always doesn't look good. <laughs> so come on. Um, where are all the guests? How many people do we have now? We, we do have 16, 16. participants. 16. Yeah. Um, I have this stupid message here and I can't share the screen. You can't share the screen? Alfredo, you may need to give him permission to say the um, chat. Ah, yeah. yeah, okay, yes. So go to the green thing and not... Yeah, I did. Yes. It might, must work right now. Does yeah. it work? Yeah, no, it doesn't. Yeah, you have to click on the arrow that's to the right. Yeah, the I did. I said multiple participants can share simultaneously. So he should be able to share that. Yes, 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 yes. My computer tries it. It's just jumping between the different uh, applications. At the end, it will get it. we will get somewhere. Now my picture is stuck. Come on. Is it clearly promising? Flickering around between. You, Bruno, you should be able to select one of your screens. Yeah, yeah no, no. It's currently, currently, it's flickering between the picture, and I didn't, I don't know what's going on. I think I have to leave and to come back. I think uh, Zoom got crazy. Mm. Sorry for this. Sorry, sorry for this. It's, <laughs> it's not your fault. I even can't leave. Ah, God. We can we can kick you from the meeting if you if you're not capable of leaving. Oh yeah, just kick me out of the meeting. Ah. Can you yeah. do? Can you, you do this? Yeah. Can you see do this, you, Alex? Yeah. See you in a second. Oh, no. I think now oh. it's it's it seems it has recovered. So yeah. Okay. You try. You can see my screen. There we go. Yeah. We will go you can see your screen. screen. Come on. Yeah, when I get now the full oh wow. Wow, what a step. We have the full screen. That's perfect okay. now. Okay. Hi, welcome everybody for this seminar giving from my living room at home. It's uh, the new situation we have to live with this, I think. Uh, the first part will be a bit technical, so if there are questions, feel free uh, to interrupt me and to ask when I'm not clear. I'm an engineer, sometimes maybe I'm a bit fast. Uh, so really feel free to do this. Uh, the second half will be, will lead, I hope, into a kind of open discussion, uh, which we will have, I think, more at the end. But the same, if there are important points, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, with this I will start. Nuclear high-risk technology, uh, I would say yes. Or what happens if risk communication fails? And this is, I think, um, this is the bridge, the bridge between engineering on the one hand and risk communication at the other end where my wife is sitting. Uh, we have somehow uh, to bridge this gap since if we are not successful, then we will end up as what I will show you in the next, uh, let's say, 40 minutes or something like that. Okay, first a little bit about me. I'm, I'm Bruce the engineer, mechanical engineering, energy engineering, a bit of nuclear. I spent my whole life in nuclear working for the German Reactor Safety Authority, working for a reactor developer, 
uh, did my diploma thesis at the Rex Safety Authority. Then I went into research, uh, was in three different research institutions. Uh, Newton Physics and Reactor Technology, Reactor Safety, Safety Research. You see everything turns always around nuclear. And it turns about the PhD, which was ma mathematical modeling for nuclear. So everything is, is around this. And yeah, I finally ended up here in Liverpool with a with the NNL Royal Academy Research Chair in Modeling and Simulation for Nuclear Engineering. And that's where I am, and that's why I'm here. Okay, with this, I'll give you a short insight into reactor safety, about the principles, about what people think about, and it will start with a kind of slideshow, and then we'll get a bit deeper. Okay, this is reactor safety as we want to see it. A reactor, a very specific reactor, very well operating. What we don't want to see is this. This is after the accident. That was three, that's Three Mile Island. We will come back to this. That was 1979. This one, uh, I didn't find the exact reactor uh, from the outside before the damage, but I have taken another one. There are not enough of them standing around. I think everybody knows this picture. That's Chernobyl, 1986. Uh, that the by far largest nuclear accident we had in, in civil nuclear energy production. And then we have, I think, this picture, everybody re remembers that was Fukushima before and this was Fukushima after. So this is not what we want to see. So reactor safety, we want to see the first picture, but not the second. And I will now try to explain you and give you a bit of insight how we intend to avoid seeing the second picture. General principle. If you go back to the, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the sub body of the United Nations responsible for everything around nuclear, uh, there is a clear definition what's the aim of reactor safety. It's the fundamental safety objective is to protect people and the environment from harmful effects of ionizing radiation. That is, that is all. That is the overarching principle under this. It's like a tree. This is the this is the core, and now we branch out and branch out into different steps how to achieve this. So it's not only it's not only this this one text. It is a whole strategy, a whole procedure. How you go from this into different steps to create a safe reactor. And the first step. We see here, we go from the safety objectives, yes, the general safety objective, into three different fundamental safety functions everybody has to fulfill who wants to operate the reactor. We have to be able to control the reactivity, which uh, just doesn't say more than we have to be able to shut down the reactor. We have to be able to assure the cooling of the fuel, so when we have shut down the reactor, we still have to be able to cool it and to keep the integrity of the fuel. And this will automatically assure confining radioactive material. And now we go back into the slideshow. Three Mile Island. Uh, when we think about, uh, I'm normally quiz this for my, PhD, for my PhD students or for my, for my students, since they have a bit more background. Uh, so we go through what happened there and uh, which which of the steps did work well and which ones had some problems, yes. There we had a good control of the reactivity, so we were able to shut down the reactor. That is the point. But uh, then the next challenge comes, uh, when you shut down the reactor, you still have uh, the decay heat, so you still have to remove heat. And then you're not able to remove the heat, then your fuel will start to melt. This is exactly what happened. So we missed cooling the fuel. And typically when you miss cooling the fuel, you get immediately a problem in confining the radioactive material since it will be set free from the fuel. And in TMI, we had some releases. I have put it yellow since it was at least limited. When we go to Chernobyl, I think uh, there we failed completely. That's clear. Controlling the reactivity was at this point, really, the result, and you see the result at this picture. So when you are not able to control the reactivity, so to shut down the reactor, then you have really the risk that you have a massive explosion, not in the dimension, and you have 
like like when you're able to do this, it is then a nuclear explosion, and you have to accept that you will get a massive damage of your facility. So when the when you can't control the reactivity, fuel is automatically destroyed, and the confinement of the radioactive material will definitely be important. Let's go to Fukushima. Yeah, people think about the explosion in Fukushima, but we were successful in controlling the reactivity. The explosion was not driven nuclear. This was a chemical explosion, which means the power of the explosion was much lower than what we have seen in Chernobyl. We have missed again cooling of the fuel, fuel melt. So the, what happened is a bit comparable to what happened in, in Three Mile Island, but we were not able uh, to confine the radioactive material as efficient since the systems were not designed in the same way as, as in Three Mile Island. With this, I will try to dig in now a bit into, into uh, the depth of reactor safety. Since the reactor safety is much more than, than the fundamental safety functions, as I said, it's, it's like a tree. Uh, you see what comes after uh, the fundamental safety functions. You have the, you have the safety functions and all of them are then written down in what you have to fulfill. So there's a, there's a whole procedure behind. But what I, what I want to bring to you in more detail is, is how, we, how we try to deal with this. The first important thing is we is distinguish between different uh, levels of, of accidents, incidents, operations, and so on. So we have normal operation. Normal operation should be the case which is always that is green. So we want to have uh, as high as possible frequency of occurrence in the normal operation. Then we have what we call operational incident. It can be just something which leads to a shutdown of the reactor. It can be, it can come from the outside when the generator uh, fail, when the generator fails over the net, net connection, it can be, it can be a, a stuck valve, it can be a overpower production. All of this is called the operational incident. Typically operational incidents in a well-maintained reactor happen less than once a year. That's the frequency of, of, of occurrence and the potential to damage the plant is normally zero. After an operational incident, you can restart your reactor normally within minutes to hours. That is that is what you want to see. So, for example, when you have when you have a problem with the generator or in that connection, you switch off the reactor and you restart it. When you go to the next level, it's the so-called design-based accidents. So, accidents which are planned in the design that the system can deal with and the frequency of occurrence viewed is normally estimated in the maximum once per lifetime of a reactor that is set to rough plan since we have to expect here that we will get some damage to the plant and that's then a matter of investment protect, uh, protection that you have the right uh, systems to control this but you should it shouldn't happen but when it happens, the system is designed to control it. And then we have the last level, the severe accidents. These will be three uh, I have shown you. There we have a definite potential of damaging the plant and the frequency of occurrence should be never. That is the aim. We haven't been really successful with it. We know this, we have lost some reactors, but that is part of the story. Okay, now we get in a bit into risk thinking and probability. So we are, we are approaching the Risk Institute. Okay, so we have the same here. So normal operation, incident, accident, and uh, then we go into this, this is severe accident. And you see here the same, you have the frequency here. So the frequency is high, but the radiation level given to the outside is everything what is below 50 microsieverts per year is is a level uh, which is which is covered by normal operation so everything you see here uh, there is no release no additional release to the to the environment which is above the limit that is that is what what is the classical design and then you have we have some area which gets a bit more tricky this is when we approach this what we call the severe accident we said 
normally very easy should never happen in in a reactor and so we have here different different methods and different approaches to deal with so there is uh, what we call civil accident prevention so this is this is uh, things you can do still be on the way to avoid the severe accident to 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 progress then we have severe accident mitigation there we live now we leave now this area of lower 50 microsievert to 250 that is the expected ex or uh, acceptable accidental release and this we try to keep the system below this level by trying to mitigate the progress of the accident and then we have this very very interesting red part we call this residual risk the residual risk is things we try to eliminate with a view can be how should i say it can be excluded in a physical or engineering way a typical example would be uh, the rupture of the whole pressure vessel in the pressure water reactor is that it could be an accident which you have no chance to control at all so what you do is you define principles that this can't happen for example uh, by defining uh, material characteristics in a way that you will maybe run into a leak, but uh, the leak can only lead to, to loss of, of a certain amount of water, but it will not, you will not go into a rupture of the whole system. This is the typical way to deal with these residual risks, since uh, these are, you try to exclude that this can happen, but this means it doesn't go into any safety calculations later on. Anybody clear about this? Since this, this is a very, very tricky area to, uh, to describe, but it's a very essential area <clears throat> that there is always this, this part of the residual risk which you try to design out, but which is, which is not going into any of, of the safety estimation calculations in the moment when you have decided to design it out. Okay, so let's go on. How do we deal with it? There is a very famous principle of nuclear. It's, it's a so-called defense in depth. It starts with this. When you remember this, we had this normal operation, incidents, accidents, severe accidents. And we follow here exactly the same principle. And it's a very interesting IEA report. And it shows uh, why things are like this. So we want to prevent abnormal operation and failures. And then how can we achieve this through conservative design, high quality in construction and operation? So you see, reactor safety doesn't start in when you have an accident. It starts in the very beginning. It starts in the design. It starts in the manufacturing of, of the plant. And there is the core when you are good there, you can reach a stable operation. And stable operation means absence of incidents. And this is what you want to have. In the case you have an incident, you have to control ab ab abnormal operation, de detect failures. So you make your system resilient against going away from, from normal operation. And this you do through control, limiting and protection systems and surveillance features. So you try to, you, you try to bring automatically the system which has, which has left the normal operation level back into normal operation. And that is why Incident level is, is typically not leading to any damage of the reactor. It is just just something you deviate from standard operation and you try to come back as soon as possible. Then we have the accident level in the design basis. And for this, we deal with engineering safety features and accident procedures, which are able to protect now really the facility and the environment from progression of the of the accident. And only when we miss there, we go into this prevention of accident progression and mitigation of severe accidents. And there we have accident management measures which can be used to get the risk down. And only in the very worst case, let's call it uh, Fukushima, you have significant releases. And with this, the only way to react on is offsite emergency response, but this is things you don't want to see 
So that is why there are all these levels below to try to bring the system always back into a more stable state. Yeah. In addition, think about the main principle, protect the environment from the release of ionizing radiation. The reactor system is designed in a multi-barrier strategy. It starts in the very center. Here we have the reactor, we have the secondary cycle where we produce the energy and we have the cooling tower. And here inside we have the reactor. The reactor itself consists of pure rods. Pure rods, we have about 65,000 pure rods in the reactor. And each of them are filled with fuel in the form of the ceramic matrix. This matrix holds back about 90% of the fission products. So the ionizing radiation. Then they are in a leak tight seal cladding, the cladding. Uh, so these leak tight claddings have about 65,000. And around this, you have the, your primary circuit, which is another closed system. It is here, everything was in red where in the case you have a leak in the cladding, you will get radiation there, but it will stay in this closed loop. And only when this loop would rupture, then we have the next barrier level, the containment, which is around everything to capture then the radioactive release. To give you a feeling, out in a good reactor operation, it's estimated that you have less than one damaged fuel rod per year out of the 65,000. So the quality issues level is really high. Yeah, with this, now we go a bit deeper into engineering. Important, important principles, uh, how engineers try to, to get the reactor safe. So the first principle is redundancy. So this is, you have a series of identical systems which back up each other depending on the setting you need, either in a parallel setting or in a serial setting. And typical example, are rows of safety valves. It's the emergency cooling system chains where you typically have three or four chains. Uh, the energy, the emergency power supply like the diesels where you have typically four, six diesel generators standing next to each other, each one protected from each other with thick con concrete walls. So that is one thing, redundancy. Second is diversity. Diversity means you try to solve the problem not only with one principle, you have different principles. Typical example is for example, the reactor shutdown. You have the control rods, which are normally used to shut down the reactor, but when the control rods should fail, you have a completely different procedure. You would mix some absorbing material into the coolant and would shut down the reactor in this way. Or another example is the emerging power supply. So there we have a backup connection to the to to the electricity net. So in the case the own production fails, the reactor can take electricity from the net. And a backup system, we have diesel generators which are completely diverse. It's a completely other technology. Or we have batteries, for example, for, for control actions. The same, different principles to to assure that the that. Uh, you don't have a common cause failure, a failure which would, uh, would affect all the 10 identical systems since they are maybe ill-designed. Another example is immersion in the heat sink in a, in a sodium cooled bus reactor. You can either take the heat out through the normal water heat exchangers or you can take it out through air coolers, so two different operational principles. Further on with the principle, fail safe. Fail safe means when a system fails, it has to go into a safe state. So uh, if it would be your car, when your car fails, it drives to the side of the road. Oof. And then it goes into an emergency shutdown. Or it's, for example, the magnetic cord or the control rods, when electricity is lost, they automatically fall in since they're held by electromagnets. It's that broken, that broken sensors you typically have you have a series of sensors go to alarm state and you define your system that, for example, when you have three sensors and two give alarm, then you have real alarm. So can, you can afford that one goes, if it's going, if it's breaking, it's going into an alarm state. Or another example maybe um, from, the, from, from the 
normal life is when when you have a, a trainer on your tr on a truck, you typically have air pressure brake. And as long as the air pipe is not connected from the truck to the trailer, the brakes are closed. So it's, it's safe. And only when, and in the case the, the pipe would rupture the same, the brakes will close and you go to a safe state. Yeah, and the very last one, which is a comparably newer one, is the balance of prevent prevention and mitigation. So we have systems which prevent that, they, that an accident will happen, for safety system, uh, emergency cooling system, or you have systems which are which come into action to reduce the risk that the accident progresses by mitigating what's going on. So a typical example for this is when you want to be sure that you have no sodium leakage in the sodium could fast reactors and sodium should not react with air, but even worse, it should not react with concrete. So you could do a double wall piping so in the case you have a leak in the inner wall, you would just go to the outer wall and that's it. That's prevention of, of an accident. The other would be you have a, you have a stainless steel collection tray be, below your pipe, which means you avoid that the sodium drops to the concrete. It just falls into a stainless steel, in, into a, into a stainless steel tray. And there, even if it would catch fire, uh, you don't have really problematic reactions. So that is the balance every reactor designer tries to find. Yeah, with this I'm through the principles and we'll go to reactor safety as a living body since uh, it sounds strange, but it's, it's really like this. Uh, reactor safety is a thing which, which goes through the whole life cycle of a nuclear reactor. It starts with the design, I told, conservative well balance. It's the construction, high quality construction. It's the operations high quality of operation, educated operators, well-trained operators. It is the exchange of operational experiences. So in, in, in many countries, you have complete databases where all the operators have, have, have access uh, to see what happened in other reactors and how did they deal with it and to learn could this have consequences for our own system and in Germany, retrofitting on basis of science and technology. That is, uh, even if you have a reactor, when science and technology progresses, you have to adopt your system to the newest findings. With this, I'm, I'm through the first part. If there are any technical question, drop in and ask. Sebastian, unmute, yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, can you go to your reactor picture, please? Oh, which one? This one? Uh, yeah, that one. You mentioned that the, you know, the, there was, um, you know, a radioactive release within the reactor. So let's say the clad, you know, suffered a crack and some of the fuel, you know, was released into the reactor. You said that because there's a secondary coolant cycle, um, you know, that introduces extra safety measures to prevent further you know, a further release into the outside, okay? But what would happen in the case of a BWR where you only have one cycle and there's no heat exchange? It's directly okay. That's a very good, very specific question, yes. So, so there, are two, there are two different levels. So in a pressurized water reactor, if you have a leak in a fuel rod, typically you don't release fuel. What you would, what you release is just fission gases, which- Yeah, yeah, but I mean radioactive- water. But, and this is now very interesting, in a pressurized water reactor, this goes into the water and the water will carry the radioactivity forward. That is why this, this closed primary circuit is very, very important. In a BWR, the system is, the system is different. So you, you carry from the reactor only steam forward mm -hmm. and it is known that about 95% of the radiative contamination stays in the water. So, so what you do in a, in, a, in a boiling water reactor is you try to clean or to dry the steam as much as possible, which helps you massively to avoid carry on of radiation. That is, that is a big difference. But doesn't the turbine get impregnated by the, by the radiation at the same time? 
I mean, exactly, that is the point. You don't want to have this, so it, it, it's absolutely essential to get the water out of the steam. So you want to have as dry steam as possible, and so you invest very much into steam drying within the reactor, within which is in within the reactor pressure vessel, that the water stays within the reactor pressure vessel. That is the that is the major difference. If there is a larger accident, then you can immediately isolate. Uh, these pipes which go through the containment into the turbine room. So that is that is the next consequence and it's, it's the same of, of defense in depth. So in normal operation, you try to suppress the radiation going to the turbine by drying the steam. If you would have, and, and a, a leaked fuel rod is still normal operation. And in the case you have more, then you have here typically insulation valves which you have, by the way, the same in a pressurized water reactor to isolate the containment in the case uh, you would have a leak from the, from the primary to the secondary circuit. So can we say then that the risk is slightly higher in a BWR compared to the PWR? If it's correctly operated, no, I wouldn't say this. I wouldn't say this. It, it's, uh, the, that is, that is what brings us back to this to this tree, which you do, for example, for prob probability safety analysis. You will see that uh, the contamination risk is maybe different weighted from different accident paths, from different incidents. That is that is uh, the overall risk of a boiling water reactor and the pressurized water reactor is not significantly different. Thank you, Bruno. You're welcome. Okay, good. Any other question? If not, uh, let's go back and let's go for the German history, the second part where we see what happens and things go wrong. Yes, so German light water reactor operation. Germany had about 20 light nuclear power plants, which have been operated without major incidents for, for mm, almost 30 years each. 30 of them have been built before 1975, the other seven after 1975, you will see that's a very significant date. And yeah, the German pressurized water reactors as well as the boiling water reactors are recognized as, as world's best. They, they are cutting edge still, they are, they are leading the operation. In, when we go back from 1990 till 2005, out of the 10 best operating reactors in the world, in the average six to seven, six to seven out of 10 were in Germany. So it looks like a absolutely successful industry, perfect in delivery. We have nuclear power plants, which run without any incident from through the whole cycle. So everything seems to be a very, very successful industry. And then I think three days after Fukushima, the government decided to close eight uh, reactors immediately and the rest of them within 10 years. So, end of one of the most successful industries you can imagine, that is just something went obviously wrong. Since there is no argument from engineering and science on this. There was nothing in Germany there was we have, with perfect operation, everybody in the world will sign this. And still the government made this decision. And with this, I will dig into, dig into the history. Yeah, what happened? It's not a thing which happened from one day to the other. It's something which accumulated over, over time and time. It's that, I, I, I tried to figure out where did, where, did, where did it really start? We have to think back to the 1950s and 60s, where nuclear uh, was the high-tech technology, and we had the big promises like two chip to meter, and uh, we will deliver all the energy for the future. And I think in the 1950s and 60s, the people really believed into this, that, that this is the way into the future. But the people started to get some doubts about it. It's very interesting that this happened already in the early 70s. So it is not 
that it happened after Three Mile Island, where where you could say, okay, there was a, there was the first major accident in the power producing unit, and now it it, it accumulated to another way. I, I, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know where it came from, but it accumulated into creating an anti-nuclear movement, which led to the growth of the Green Party, and they had a very early success. Uh, in the southwest of Germany, there was a plan to build a nuclear power plant, which was given up in 1975 under heavy protests. It's not that this nuclear power plant wasn't built; it was just built in the form of the, the energy supply board shares in three different French nuclear power plants just across the border. But uh, physically, this plant was not built in Germany. And this was a very, very first, very powerful signal against nuclear. And uh, yeah, it ended up in, in January 1980, when in the southwest of Germany, there was the funding uh, event of the Green Party in Germany. And uh, this was formed mainly out of the anti-nuclear and the environmental movement of the 70s. And one of the core principles of the Green Party is still to be anti-nuclear. Yeah, uh, the next disaster came in reprocessing. Germany thought about to build their own reprocessing plant. And the construction even had started. And in 1981, there was the foundation of an action group against the reprocessing plant. 1985, the official construction start was under heavy protests and uh, the protests lasted for years. And to a really large extent, there were very many people traveling to the middle of nowhere, the border between Bavaria and Czech Republic. And it led in, end of May 1989 to the stop of construction. The same, it's not that Germany didn't go for reprocessing. Uh, Germany just sponsored La Hague and sponsored Thorpe in UK and the reprocessing was done there. So the second time the industry didn't get their project, but they got their aims. And you see they're, they're becoming to a, to a strange balance that the industry started to think maybe it's not worth to go the to go it the hard way. Yeah, then we had two other uh, interesting projects in, in innovative reactor development. Germany was one of the top players in sodium fast reactor technology. 1972, project started uh, the foundation stone in April 1973, all seemed progressing well. 1974, again, before we had this big accident. First project, protests, protests grew, grew in, in the late 70s, heavy, heavy protests, hundreds of thousands of people. And construction was finished in 1985, but uh, the reactor was never put into operation. And you see the top picture that is from the time of protests where it was almost finished. And then you see what's uh, going now, it's a kind of adventure park now. Reactor has never been operated, it's never been further fueled. Second one, Germany was leading in high temperature reactor technology, constructed in Hamilton, a new reactor in 1970 to 1983. The reactor went critical, first electricity production, everything looked good. It officially was then activated due to its rising cost in 1989. And in 1991, we started decommissioning it by exploding the cooling tower, um, but it's not the rising cost. It's not the rising cost in, in, in Kalkar, in, in the one I have shown you before in the sodium fast track, it's not the, high, the rising cost in, in, in high temperature reactor technology. The real point is that, this, that the project lost the political support. And now it's the question, why did they lose it? Politicians make decisions on is it favorable for me to do it or not to do it and due to the public opinion obviously uh, the politicians thought it's not favorable for them to support the project anymore. and this is what we have to what we have to accept and to see at this point 
yeah, that is what got uh, where we got to. Yeah, uh, safe is only the risk. Green Party, you see all the top stars of the Green Party holding a transparent at a, at a demonstration. I think most of them uh, are known faces in Germany, so it's really that it's really the top levels of the party, which are many of them were sitting at this time in the parliament. And yeah, this brings me to another sad story, the sad story of the nuclear waste management. Germany was one of the first countries heading for a site selection for a nuclear waste disposal. Um, that was 1977, um, again, 1979, heavy protests in local communities, growing nationwide by nuclear activ activists who decided to go there. The explanation was, uh, the exploration was driven from 1979 to 1999, and then we had a moratorium between 2000, 2000 2010, and finally, completely complete stop of, of all activities at the site. Site is a lost in innovation, uh, a lost, lost investment. And yeah, Germany is the only country which even doesn't have any idea about where to put the nuclear waste now. But it's not only this, you could say this is heavy, heavy point. It's, it's, uh, it's a disposal for, for, for high active waste plus spent fuel. So that is the place where the major risk sits. No, it's even in smaller things. We had the interim storage, which was completed in 1983. Uh, then we made a decision that there will be no new containers stored there since politicians didn't want to go the game anymore. They didn't give the, give the permission for transport. So we, when the Green Party was was on the power, they made the decision that nuclear transports are not allowed anymore, and that nuclear power plants have to build interim storages at their site, and the waste has to stay there. Now we have, instead of two central storages, we have about 15 distributed over the country. Seems to be better, at least this was what was accepted. And it's not that Germany is completely risk averse. I, I just, just to give you now some examples. Conventional waste management. Germany has four hazardous waste de deposits. One since 1972, one since 1987, one since two, 1995, one since 2006. And have a look for the cost. So if you want to get rid of highly toxic waste, you pay about 260 euros per ton. Just keep this in mind. I will give you other numbers uh, later. Yeah. So these things these things are built. So obviously it is not that we are completely risk averse, since if not we we wouldn't be able to build the other ones. And that was last year. Minor explosion in in a, in a mining facility. Two people injured. Dozens are secured. Um, that was that was a toxic waste disposal facility. It was a message. It disappeared two days later. This wouldn't have happened to nuclear. And this is this is for me the question: What did we do wrong on this way? Since Germany, it's the same. Another example: intermediate waste, inter low-level waste storage. Uh, other countries do this on ground. I will show you pictures later. Germany has decided to do it underground in a former, in a former uh, iron mine. And yeah, um, we have invested almost 3 billion euros to build this. And start of operation was scheduled for in 2008 for 2013. Now we are back at 2022, but uh, nobody expects that the operational permission will be given in 2022. And the cost. So when you want to get rid of low level nuclear waste, which has, a, has to have a very no heat production, very low radiation level, it costs you about 4,000 euro per ton. It's, it's, it's a factor of almost 20 
from compare to when you want to get rid of highly toxic waste. So it's for me the question, is this an overshoot or not? Very interesting point. You see how other ones do this. That's France. They have built their repository. It's, it's over ground. You see the buildings here, the storage buildings, concrete buildings where the stuff is put in and that's it. You go to France again. These are other ones. One which is closed, you see, is at the end covered with, with soil. It's, 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 they go grass on and that's it. That's, that's how the French deal with this. Uh, they have selected, uh, selected their site in 1987, uh, got in 1989 the authorization, and in 1992 they started to commission it and to fill it. UK, Drake, uh, it's close to Sellafield. You see the same, you see more, the sa more or less the same a big concrete base where the containers are stored. Uh, it's operating since 1959. Uh, uh, that you see this part is already is already filled and yeah it will be step by step uh, the same near surface uh, repository and yeah obviously we see uh, a tiny protest but that's it it's completely different to what we have seen in germany that brings me to the fact to the final slides what went wrong in germany that is, a, that is a core question. I think the anti-nuclear community was encouraged by the successful protests. Uh, nuclear research was a very close community for a long time. Don't speak to the people outside. The research believed that uh, they know it better and they don't need to communicate since uh, the Arab people will not understand what we're doing. So yeah, I think it wasn't a good approach. The energy suppliers, as I said, gave up already very early in, in the game and they stopped any, any kind of, of really communication efforts and decided better to go to other countries and to, to do this stuff there. Yeah, and I will close with this, what can go wrong in communication? This was after a major, I think, national team football match was suspended. There was a there was a press conference given by the by the Ministry of the Interior in Germany, and he gave a rather strange explanation. And Teil der Antworten würde die Bevölkerung für uns in better in English. A part of the answer would alienate, alienate the public. Uh, what does this mean? This means you are more worried when he, after he has said this. This can't be risk communication. You can't communicate the risk by telling the people, no, I don't tell you the risk, since you would be more worried when you know what was the risk. This, I think, can't be a good way to go. And with this, I hope for a lively discussion about how can we communicate risk better or uh, what can we learn from this and why is it, is it important? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you much, Bruno. If you un if you unshare or stop sharing, yes, your uh, screen. Give me a second. I will try. Uh, here, yes, I hit the right button. Yes, so yeah. we can you can get me back. Okay, yeah. Okay, questions, discussions, contributions. Okay, can I ask a question? Hi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so just just a short question uh, about the uh, conclusion on the communication of the uh, risk, uh, mis, uh, risk of the miscommunication and comparison of Germany with other countries like UK and what's what, what went wrong in Germany in comparison with other countries. So if you compare these uh, facts you gave us with Russia, for example, yeah, you will see that in Russia was uh, after Chernobyl, everything went exactly the same way, but somehow uh, they uh, their business was uh, or nuclear business was able to overcome it, uh, while in Germany it went in a wrong way. Why do you think it's happened? Uh, and what's what's uh, so? I mean, all the points you uh, mentioned in your 
uh, presentation, it, 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 it relates exactly to Russia. So closed nuclear com research community, non-communicating with the public, uh, the protests in, after the Chernobyl uh, also encouraged the people and so on. But uh, by the fact, we see now the quite strong uh, positions of the uh, Russia on uh, nuclear market while in Germany, uh, the nuclear power plants are closed. So can you comment on it? That's, that's a very, that's, Dennis, that's a very, very good point. I can only speculate. <laughs> yes, there is, please. <laughs> there, are different, there are different points, there are different points. So A, Germany could afford to close their nuclear power plants. I think if you would do this in Russia, you would have a massive electricity shortage. So the people, somehow started to accept that sometimes we, somehow we need this. That is one thing. The other thing is we should not forget the major company building nuclear power plants in Russia is a Russian state company. Yeah. So Rosatom is making big business out of it. In Germany, it was Siemens, KWU, Areva, uh, or how you want to call it. It was always a private company. That is the difference. So it's much easier for a, for a country to give up when it's not their state's company. Then there is another point, mm. uh, which works for Russia the same as for UK, as for US, as for France. Mm. Or they start to recognize what, what I want to go to. <laughs> sure. that is, uh, these countries uh, have a nuclear deterrent. And so the government is not completely free compared to other countries, other yeah. countries which have been absolutely successful in nuclear. Yes. Just let's call them Germany, Sweden, and Korea. Absolutely world leading nuclear industry, all of them. And the government at a certain point made a decision to phase out nuclear. And they destroyed this business. So obviously, there is, this is another argument which plays in the game. Uh, but I'm not sure if this is all. I always claim there is another point. If nuclear would have been able to deliver a market-ready, good business product after Three Mile Island, then the business would have gone on. Yeah. Accidents happen. Airplanes drop from the sky, but it hasn't stopped the flying airplanes. Exactly. Now, there are other things behind. Sure, to step into an airplane gives you a personal advantage. To have electricity from a nuclear power plant does not always give you a personal advantage as long as it's not, it's not significantly cheaper than all, the, all other electric energy. So, you see, it's a, it's a conglomerate. You can't... You, in my view, you can compare the things always easily, since, uh, but at the end, I think uh, what is what is what is the core point is there were promises, and these promises were only partly fulfilled. We never spoke about that uh, everything will go fine or not go fine, and. Based on this, um, we missed out the second part. The second part is you need somebody who buys your product. That is that is exactly, an important yeah. point. Yeah, right. That's and right. and obviously that is that is another point which is definite to Russia. There is a demand. They deliver obviously interesting products and they can sell it around the world. So there, there, there are different things which play into, but I think risk communication is a very, very important one. Since when you read German newspapers, even about smallest incidents, they mm -hmm. are always, always put onto headlines and are reported very negative. So when you compare it then to to other international views on it, you see that things do not fit together anymore. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting discussion. Um, if can I ask one more question, or uh, no, let, let's give it to others. <laughs> I have... Adolfo raised raised his hand to ask a question. 
I have a question. Just, yeah, just, uh, just uh, uh, sorry to point out quickly. If you would like to uh, ask a question, you can raise your hand, and then it's easy to see uh, who wants to come out as a question next. Yeah, when can uh, I you... notice you a second? Yeah. yeah uh, so can, can I? I... Go first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank Thanks. Uh, my question is is very generic question. Uh, oh, so, uh, in two thousand. Sorry, sorry Venkat. Okay. Venkat, sorry. My May question is very. Sorry, sorry. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, Venkat. Uh, yeah. Focus is is muted. That is the problem. He can't speak. Uh, okay. Okay. No, no, no. I I, I can hear him. Okay. No, That's I good. can't. I can't hear Adolfo. This is why. Oh, no, no, no. I let I let Venkat have the floor. I let him go first. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So my question is, you know, we it, it's it's not nothing related to safety or anything, uh, risk or anything. We UK has a commitment by 2050 to you know that net zero carbon emissions. So can we achieve it without nuclear? Like you know the like the way Germany is doing. Germany is not going to go ahead with any nuclear whatsoever. It's a firm no. But can we, in within UK, can we achieve it without nuclear just by depending on renewals in 30 years time? We are at 2020 now. By 2050, we have to have, you know, we have to meet that commitment. So is it practically achievable without uh, a nuclear in the mix of, you know, renewals? That was unfair. You just changed your question in the very last sentence. <laughs> I had already the answer. Uh, um, practically achievable, I think no. Uh, achievable, yes. It is a matter of I, what kind of electricity price you are willing to accept. It's a matter of what kind of facilities you are willing to accept. So you would have to have massive energy storages, especially in, in the form of, 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 of hydro storages, in the form of, of short-term storages. And you would have to build a massive overcapacity. Uh, so all of this, and you would have to diversify. We come back to uh, diverse. When you want to have something safe, you have to have it diverse. You have to have different. So when no wind blows, then you have to have another source. So it doesn't help you to build more wind plants at a certain point, since when no wind, then no energy. So I think practically for a country like UK, it will be very, very complicated. For a country like Germany, it's much easier. Germany is sitting like a spider in the middle of the net of, of, of the European network, which is the largest electricity network in the world. So they can always get electricity from other countries. But uh, it's a question, but the, this comes exactly to the point what, what I have described, uh, what happened in nuclear. The nuclear power plant was bought in shares in France, the reprocessing, was just exported to France and to UK. So that is that is what you what it's exactly the same step. When you're willing to do this and you have the strong enough overseas cables to Norway and to France and maybe to Belgium, you could. But it's a question, is it the way you want to achieve it? Or is it better uh, to produce and to have your own and the electricity supply? And there, nuclear has the advantage of being 24-7 available, switch on and switch off in the worst case, which uh, shows if you want to have a reliable electricity production and you don't want to rely on getting electricity delivered from somewhere else, I think you won't make it without nuclear, but that is a, a matter of to communicate it the right way to the right people that the right decisions will be made. Okay, now to Adolfo, sorry for this. <laughs> uh, no problem. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Professor Bruno. So I have two questions, two very short questions. So we just go one by one. Um, the first question might be a little bit naive, but I just want to uh, um, like, like sort of like check with you. So I'll just like ask what exactly is the state of the uh, research in Gen 4 power plants? And would you reckon that because of the fact that Gen 4 power plant you know, works mainly on passive systems and it sort of eliminates human error, would that help to actually give confidence to the public in supporting the uh, nuclear technology in the future? Very good point. Um, I have some doubts. 
I'm more honest. Uh, I'm a nuclear engineer. I'm working with chips since 30 years or 20 years. Uh, in general, GIF Generation for International Forum tries to answer this question to, to push new reactor technology. But I think we need more of a step change. We, uh, most of these technologies go back to the 50s. Sodium good fast reactor was the first reactor we have ever, we have ever used to produce electricity to produce electricity, there's a famous EBR1 and the, and the light bulb. So, so I think uh, if nuclear really wants to be successful in the long term, we need, we need what we call a game changer technology. A technology which brings us away from, from this 50s technologies. Light bulb reactors have been designed to, for propulsions of submarines. And at this point, nobody thought about the risk potential of this amount of energy stored in the system since then in a, sub, in a submarine somewhere in the Pacific, even if it goes wrong, there's enough cool in the ground. Uh, when we started to adopt this to, to, to solid ground, we had to put this massive containment around, which is a massive cost driver. Yep. Since we had no idea how to deal with this, with this problem. And so, in my view, I'm, I'm one of the innovation drivers of the game, I would say, when we want to be successful, we have to go, we have to go into a level which goes above what we think about it for. It right. is not that these levels are not available and that the brilliant idea is not available. It is about getting it to the right people and getting it going in the right way. We mm -hmm. have to deliver on a better way of dealing with the nuclear waste since yep. we can't tell people that we use that we use about one percent of the energy content of the uranium we mine somewhere in Australia, Canada or Africa, and we throw the rest into a final disposal and declare it as waste. This isn't a good way. We can't explain the people why Hinkley Point C is so incredibly expensive. These are the things we have to tackle to make nuclear the game of the future right thank you so much okay so moving on to my second question so uh, i'm not sure if this was covered previously because i'm sorry i came a bit late but i'd like to ask um earlier on you mentioned about fremont island accident so i remember a uh because i actually did a bit of a study years ago for my final dissertation on fremont island and i understand that um this is one accident in which there's a high degree of epistemic uncertainty with regards to the degree of the degradation of the reactor core. Now, such such uh, like like issues will actually in turn will impact the assessment of the uh, like 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 you know the top event analysis when you do like a fault tree or uh, analysis you know to calculate like 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 when you do a calculation of like the probability of failure eventually you know from all these chain events, like like you know because of the fact that no one could actually assess the containment. Uh, because of the risk involved in the in the radiation and all that, and do you think that this actually poses a a uh, challenge in in like you know exactly uh, you know in actually doing this sort of like uh, in depth risk assessment of uh, the nuclear power plant core accidents like this? Yes, you have to. It's it's a it's a very uh, three mile island was a breaking point, a breaking mm -hmm. point of how to design nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. And it was, compared to the other accident, a very exceptional accident. It was in an almost brand new facility. Yeah. And I think uh, nuclear has learned very much out of, of, out of Three Mile Island. And exactly these principles like redundancy, diversity, prevention and mitigation, fail safe, they have been, they, they are the outcome of this. That you should, for example, eliminate common cause failures. It doesn't help you to have 10 diesel generators when something prevents diesel, a diesel generator from operating. Mm -hmm. 10 do not help you. So that is, that is why, why this principle of diversity has got, has got a, a, a massive push out of the Mad Island. That, uh, so, and this is a, exactly a point since the common cause failure is something which, which creates a massive uncertainty in, in all your four trees and everything. Uh, since if this happens, you would lose you would lose maybe three different plant safety systems 
together since it's a common cause stadium. So you have, it's, this has changed the, de the design principles very much. But in general, this brings me back to the point before. I think we have to tackle the problem much deeper on the root. And the root problem of, a, of Three Mile Island is it's a pressurized water reactor, which means you have, when you operate a pressurized water reactor, you have, I, I was compared to a bottle of champagne. Uh, you have a bottle of champagne and you open it and uh, on the, you have, you have this small top volume where there is air in it. And this is the amount of, amount of, of energy potential you use to produce electricity. But some, yeah. if somebody pulls over the bottle, then all the sh champagne is spread, or, is spread in, your, in your flat on your table or somewhere. So you have to deal not only with this small volume, you have to deal with the full volume. And yes. exactly the same you see in the pressure as water reaction. You have tons and tons of hot, high pressure water, which will all turn into steam in the case of a leak. Yep. And you have then to deal with all this horribly large amount of energy stored. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the root problem. And we have to discuss, based on this root problem, is this the way to go forward or not? Yes, thank you for the analogy. I really like this uh, champagne uh, example. Yeah, but thank you so much for the clear explanation. Really appreciate it. Thank you You're so welcome. much. Yeah. Um, Dennis wants to speak, and Sebastian raised oh. a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speak first. Yeah, you you can ask first, Sebastian. No problem. I have okay. already asked the question. Um, my question is basically, you know, the question that I have right now is basically, why is the mentality so different between the UK and Germany? I mean, why did, you know, the UK prefer to tackle at the very first point, the high level waste and the intermediate level waste, why, well, especially, especially the high level waste, and why did Germany decide to tackle first the low level waste and the very low level waste? Because I mean, I think, I suppose, the only reason is because of the military side of nuclear. Because why else would it be, you know, supported at some point in Britain and not supported in Germany? I mean, in, in reality, we wanted to, you know, in the end, produce the least amount of waste. So, but it seems that there's like, a, you know, hidden purpose behind all this. Because, you know, and the same goes for the Hague in France. Yeah, you go, you're you on the right, you're on the right way. Actually. The real point is, is uh, France and UK developed the reprocessing technology. They didn't develop it to, uh, for, for civil purposes. They developed it to get hands on the plutonium. That is clear. So the technology, the technology for reprocessing was developed it was not developed for the fuel of, of commercial reactors. It was developed for the fuel of reactors which were designed to produce plutonium. Magnox reactors, for example, in the UK, the gas code reactors in France. Mm -hmm. so, so this technology was available. And it was a small step to expand this technology from, from the military purpose into the civil world. That is, that is one answer. The other, the other answer comes exactly in this, in this un, uh, invisible bonding between, between the two worlds, the military world and the civil world. And why did they never try to do the simple British approach of just dumping the fuel into a silo? <laughs> <laughs> no, they saw at least when UK built Thorpe, the reprocessing facility. Yeah, but, I, mean, pre I mean, pre Thorpe. No, but. Silos Thorpe. in Sellafield that contain fuel from the 1950s and 60s. Yes. It's not been but, reprocessed. But, Sebastian, be careful. They did not do it in the 1950s since they wanted to get hands on the plutonium, which was high level plutonium for nuclear weapons. A uh, Magnus reactor produces very, very good plutonium. Mm. And they saw the plutonium as a business. Mm. And later, 
in thought, they adopted this technology for oxide fuel that they cannot, they, they can clean fuel on demand for others, for example, for Germany. So the so UK gets or got fuel delivered from Germany and from Japan, for example, for reprocessing. And in addition, they were reprocessing fuel from, from their AGRs. And, but they have never been able to close the fuel cycle. So they have only done the first step. They have only done the reprocessing. Now they are sitting on, on tons of silver plutonium and have never been able to put this plutonium back into the reactor. So it's for me the question, this brings me back to, to my old point. At the end, we have to think nuclear as, a, as, as one piece. And the reactor is only a, the tiny middle piece, the piece where we make the money. So you're and saying the that we're able to we, we, need, we need to think in addition from the front, from the moment of mining till we are in the reactor. And we have to think about what do we do with the material we take out of the reactor. When we give it out, do we? So we have to follow this this whole life cycle, and only then we can make the right decisions. Yeah, but after the reprocessing in a closed cycle, you would have again the new fuel fabrication process. So what's the problem with taking that plutonium to Springfields, you know, near Preston, and refabricate MOX fuel? That's what's the problem with that? What's the problem? The problem is that obviously. Uh, I can, can, I can count you a whole bunch of countries which have failed, which haven't been able to produce MOX or which have given up. So Germany has given up. US has invested, I think, 10 billion to me while in the Savannah Riverside plant, and it's still not working. UK has spent billions in building their MOX facility, which didn't work. Russia is still struggling in producing MOX in large amounts. India has a fast reactor program which uh, is based on delivering this MOX fuel. So obviously, it is not easy going to do it. Mm. It's a high complex technology and it's significantly different to what we have in the, in, in the normal fuel cycle. So it's in the normal fuel cycle, you can touch your fuel by hand and fill your, your pellets into this is this is no go in, in the moment that you put on you in due to the due to the toxicity. So the fuel cycle is much much more complex. Mm. Thank you very much, Bruno. You're welcome, Dennis. Okay. Uh, so Bruno, just one more short question. We didn't, we have never discussed it, but it just came in my mind that about the operators. You said that. Uh, operators are essential for the safety of the nuclear power plants. It's completely clear. But the question is, what do you think uh, the replacement of the operators with automatic system, automat uh, opt uh, automatics and all these algorithms, you know, uh, which never tired, which uh, very fast in making the decisions and so on, uh, will it increase the safety of the nuclear power plants or not? It's also even more important since nowadays everybody in the world are going to the small modular reactors and uh, this part I feel will be really uh, important in the uh, operations of the uh, small modular reactors since you can't just produce so many uh, highly skilled operators as for the uh, limited amount of the nuclear units which we, we've got now in the world. Thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. <laughs> so first of all, Germany has done halfway. So in Germany, in the moment when, um, when the safety system takes over control, so for example, when, uh, when the reactor shutdown is, is activated, you have a great period, I think half an hour, where the operators can't intervene anyway in the system. The system does mm. everything straightforward, automatically uh, going into a safe state. Mm. This, the idea was to avoid hassle reactions of, of the operator, to give them the time to, to think through the, what's going on, to consult maybe operational books, to sit together. Our operational team in Germany is, is at least two operators and the shift director, which are always on site. Which are, which are 
in action and more people are on site. So what they will do is they will immediately sit together and try to spend this half hour to, to analyze and to do and to plan the next steps. So that is, that is a part of it. The problem will be deeper. The problem will be how do you convince the regulator about the reliability of your software? I think that is, that is at, the, at the end, it, it, is, it is the same as, as autonomous driving cars. Yes, that exactly. They have the same problem. Uh, it's no problem to, to cover 95% of the situations. It's even no problem to cover 99, but the last percent will be so horribly expensive that everybody tries to shift this back onto the operator, which is the driver, which has <laughs> to take over in the moment, since you would have to have the same problem of redundancy, diversity. You would, you have, you would have yeah. to do the same, the same level. So I think uh, there will be something intermediate. It will be smart yeah. design, which, which have very strong inherent stability, which means uh, try to rely as much as possible on physical effects of, of feedback effects, for example, which stabilize mm -hmm. your system, that you can reduce the amount of operator intervention as much as possible. Then it's about to define fail-safe, very cool shutdown systems. And I think that will, that will be the step then. The step would be to have these, these highly inherent stable systems. And when something is going back, it's just falling into a fail-safe step. Yeah. That is, that, is, that is some kind of intermediate solution. But to fully operate without human intervention, I don't see it in the moment. I think there we will need massive research. AI. But I know my colleagues, for example, in, in Korea, heavily working on the autonomous operation idea. Mm -hmm. That's a very attractive idea, to be honest, <laughs> to work on it, yes. <laughs> Dennis, do you think AI can do that? AI? I don't think I don't think AI can make something reasonable at all. So. No, yeah, but what I'm <laughs> yeah, 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 but what I'm trying to say is that it's Except, pretty automatic. Uh, rec so, uh, like reactive. you know, image recognition, all this stuff. Yes, it can work, but for, yeah, but for to fully some, automate yeah. a reactor, you know, you would also need to remove the most important part of the human contribution, which is critical decision. Yeah, that's what Bruno that's to spoke about. Like, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Bruno. You're welcome. Other questions? Discussion contributions. Yeah, I, I can jump yeah, in if yeah. no one else wants to uh, raise any more questions. Um, two points. Bringing things back to risk communications. Uh, an interesting one just raised then is A, what do we think the impact of having a fully automated system would be on communicating risks? Because you're removing, yes, you're removing the human element from critical decision making, etc. But in terms of risk communication, you're removing a human element of risk communication perception. And how do we think that will affect the way people perceive these systems? And the second point was at the end, uh, I thought, yeah, it was very interesting saying, yeah, we can't tell the public because it'll alienate them. And just thinking about how that, those sorts of statements and the statements that scientists and engineers um, give to the public, obviously saying that kind of shifts the perception of risk to what, because you assume it must be something bad if they're not telling me. But understandably, there will be things that if you said to the public and they don't have um, an adequate understanding, it could equally alarm them um, to an inappropriate degree as well. Uh, and just thinking, so looking at statements like that, scientists and engineers, like what do we think we can change in the way we communicate with the public to try and avoid situations like that happening? We can't expect the public to all inform themselves and completely engage with what we're saying. But I think as, like, just to begin with, I think as a general 
thing. Um, uh, like there was just the not to like um, point fingers or anything, but the statement before about like yeah we the UK needs nuclear power to meet its environmental goals. I mean, like I I would agree with that, but that as a statement to the public kind of feels like if you're not familiar with the technology, it's like it's being forced on you. Is there, is there a way we could reword statements like that or rethink the way we communicate statements like that? I think that is, that is it's exactly this point. I had long discussions, for example, with, with Professor Taylor from, from Manchester, who's, who's doing uh, nuclear and the, and the society in, in conference together, uh, energy and the society. So it's, um, and uh, very interesting points. Um, and obviously, that's now things which are which are very different between different cultures. I've spoken, for example, with American colleagues who said uh, there is there is in the U.S. an agreement, a bit like like I told or we discussed in, with Russia. There is an agreement. Their nuclear power plants are there, and they are there, and we don't speak about them. They will be there, and that's it. But they said there is, on the other hand, a very positive appetite on, on highly innovative systems. And this is, I think, this is the key where, where we have to put hands on. It is, Richard Taylor always calls it, create the belief in nuclear. We have to come back to this point that the people believe. They can't understand it. They have to believe that nuclear can deliver the contribution which is required. This is, I think, this is the point where we, where we would have to come to, that we can deliver something which is required, but this means we have to convince them that we have the right ideas, we have the right new approaches, and the worst thing is to tell them we will put one more reactor out of uh, FCI 1960. This is not a convincing argument. So the convincing argument must be we are solving the problems of the future for you. But this has to, for this we have, nuclear industry has to change the thinking. The thinking of we are solving a problem instead of we are selling a technology we have already. And, and this has to bring us, and this is another important point, uh, history and, and the example I have given from Sweden, Korea and Germany shows uh, there is a political risk. But the political risk only is as happens uh, when you are uh, in this, in, the, in, a, in a comparably weak position. In a weak position in the form that you are dependent on politics and you don't have the trust of the electorate, since at the end, the decisive point is the electorate. The electorate never swings very high. Every, every election goes somewhere between 50, between 45 and 55%. So, so this means when you are able to convince 70% of the electorate, then no matter which party is, is in power, they will simply support nuclear. There, it's it's another convincing part for the UK is definitely the nuclear deterrent. Nobody wants to give it up. As long as you don't give up the nuclear deterrent, you will always need educated nuclear engineers. And so there is there is where the worlds come together. It's not that that uh, that civil nuclear and, and, and military use are the same, but people switch from one end to the other. For example, there is a demand. There is there is a de there is a demand of sharing facilities and so on. So it's, it's more on this end, uh, where I think we need to convince the people that nuclear can deliver. And now I ex explicitly point out deliver, not promise, deliver on the share of, of, of CO2 or carbon, low carbon power, which is needed to go for a, for a net zero society. 
that is i think what we have to what we have to deliver and this is this is the chance in this country is not too bad the public is just not deeply interested that's okay it's uh, to your other question that's a very good one i don't think that it's really convincing people uh, to say the computer will control this uh, windows is still crashing too often that people will believe us that we are, that we will be able to operate without human intervention that's why why i painted this picture uh, creating a robust system is gets exactly into the into the ia principle create the design which is robust is the best way to avoid accidents and this is what you have to what what we have to think much more from from this point that we create a system which is forgiving so uh, which means maybe we should not go like, like most of the colleagues of generation four into into power densities which are somewhere of, around the rocket engine as one of my professors always said our only problem with our rocket engine is it should have a life in not of two minutes it should deliver about 40 to 60 years so uh, maybe that is not it's not a sustainable approach maybe we have to we have to revisit thinking can we reduce this extreme power density we know we could even go high, higher than power density it is all possible but uh, it will cause problems as long as everything works well this is nice but it will cause problems when something is going wrong so to have this kind of system as i, as I pointed out which which goes into a safe state in the moment when some problems appear and then we go back with with human decision making evidence-based in in sending a team there and restart the check what's going on in the system and restart it is i think the more convincing system and when you have many reactors like small modular reactors it would not be a disaster when you have several teams traveling around and doing maintenance and checking the things and restarting the reactor in the case it has automatically shut down. I think that's more convincing. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I think it's interesting, important to consider where risk, immune and risk communication is altered by the introduction of um, like autonomous system, like self-driving cars. It'll be interesting to see how the risk communication around driving alters with this non-human entity that is taking these decisions but yeah i think absolutely it's only going to make things more difficult to get the uh the sense of risk across appropriately for the time being i, I would even not say this in reality uh, it is a good point when you think uh, there are clear expectations when you have autom autonomous driving, uh, the risk, the accident risk will be significantly lower. But the question is, who takes the responsibility when it's finally still going wrong? And this is, this is a very, since, since this brings us to, uh, is it the driver? But when it's a the driver, then uh, can I trust this system? Uh, if it's not the driver, then uh, you will have at your annual mod. You will have to have complete software checks. So it's a question of. Um, I always, I often tend to look at this in an economic way. Uh, at a certain point, safety kills the economy of all systems, and you have to find the right balance. The balance has to be different. It's, it's this balance when you, when you think going back to, to, to one of the first slides, oper normal operation incident accident. It's, it's, probability, it's, it's probability on the one hand that you run into this. So it's, it's frequency of, of repetition and consequences. And these two things you always have to see together. And this is, this is, what, what, is uh, what is very often lost, that when you have when you are able to reduce the consequences, so 
for example, with a smart reactor design, which will not end up having an explosion like in Chernobyl and distributing the coal over uh, two thirds of Europe. It was definitely the worst case of, 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 high, of, of extremely high consequences. And when you, are, when you are able to reduce the consequences, then you do not have to think too much about the frequency. So that is, that is uh, these this self-stabilizing systems, which, which will just come back, be resilient against perturbations, will, I think, be the right step to go. But always, what I speak here is not something we will have in five years. I'm a person coming from a national program. And I'm thinking about what the national program, which has the typically outlook of 10 to 30 years, would have to tackle. So these are points which have to be tackled by significant research teams to, to get this to a level that you can apply. It will not solve a problem in five years. And this is another thing which we should be very honest with the, with the people. Nobody will build a completely new react in five years. This will not be possible. And you see, that's exactly this creating belief. Don't tell things which are unachievable since people will evaluate, if you have bad luck, people will evaluate you on your words five years ago to cheat to meter. Wasn't maybe the best slogan to deliver. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll see Scott's. Yeah for a while so i think i'll pass the book over i'm i'm uh i'm interested in a lot of what you said and i'm, I'm sort of i didn't recognize that you, what you were saying was don't lie and don't over promise until the very end so i'm glad i waited to talk about this but i did want to mention that um it doesn't always work to just convince people um you know 85 to 90 percent of americans believe we need gun control and we'll never have gun control in the United States. There's another thing called regulatory capture, which we also have the nuclear regulatory in the United States. Um, we'll, we'll never get good, good uh, demo democratic results. But I'm, I'm curious as why nobody on this call even breathes the idea that uh, maybe the public and political decision in Germany was the, was the right one. I mean, obviously you guys are pretty, pretty one-sided in that respect, right? And the failure that we see in risk communication was the failure to agree with you, um, which seems pretty one-sided too. Um, it seems to me that, I mean, as you've admitted, you know, the failures of honesty uh, have a lot of the blame to, to, to burden or to, to shoulder. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> and, and it's kind of terrifying that I, I don't know who it was that you quoted, but the person who said that you have to get them to believe because they'll never understand. You just have to get them to believe. That's really, again, an abdication of the responsibility for risk communication. Um, and it will come back to bite you if you actually proceed, you know, pursue that path. And the duplicity with the military uh, schemes, you know, that just, uh, just, I mean, that's the reason even liberals who are worried about, you know, carbon will never, will never support nuclear. Uh, the nuclear industry, because they see the obvious and subtle connections with the military industries, which are an anathema. Right? And, and the nuclear industry has never been forthright about what the real depth of that connection is. Um, you know, it, in fact, remember when the nuclear winter was first popularized as an as a idea that you'd heard of? Nuclear winter. You know, the reason that they that suddenly nuclear winter was in the news. The reason was that the military wanted to create these things called bunker buster bombs, which would burrow into the earth and destroy bunkers underground, right? They didn't have the funding, they didn't have the, uh, you know, the authority to make these things. And so their scheme was to subvert the environmental awareness about the dangers of, environment, of, of nuclear uh, radiation and, 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 and basically turn it on its head so that suddenly the, the, the uh, military was funding uh, meetings in ecology to, about nuclear winter. And then within a year, there was funding for the bunker buster bombs, 
And nobody ever talked about, you know, why we got the funding for the ecological meetings. And nobody ever talked about the connection, but that's why it was. You know, and when that sort of thing happens, you know, it's the, it's not just the abdication, but the flouting of honesty in risk communication, you're never going to get compliance. Don't you think? Okay, that was a very long, very long point. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I will, to, I will try to start from the beginning. Um, um, beginning about gun control or? No, the very beginning about uh, it's a failure to comply to, or maybe the German decision was the right one. It's a failure to comply to, to my thing. I don't really believe it was the the right one, but I just like to see you twist in the wind about that a little bit. No, that's 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 a that's a very that's a very good point. Um, if you think what Germany is currently doing, then you can you can just justify that it was not the right decision. Major point is that Germany has currently still a massive. CO2 production, which is higher than ever, even if, we have, even if we have spent 20 billion per year for now more than 10 years into renewables. That's a consequence of deciding first to phase out nuclear instead of phasing out coal. So if you look from this point of view, and this is now, this is now there are different points of view, but from the point of view of, of CO2 reduction, there is currently no other technology available which can deliver on demand your electricity without massive co2 production that is that is uh, what is one thing that is what is driving nuclear in the moment in the 70s it was the same nuclear is always coming when when in coming into play in complicated times it was in the oil crisis where the people recognized oh she could go wrong with it with all this being dependent on oil and there was another massive investment in, in nuclear. So, so we can see we had, let's say, three different levels of investment. The one was the dream of phase, the phase of, of two chips to meter and everything is possible with nuclear and so on. That was the 50s. Then we had the 70s with the oil crisis, where the people had really massive fear that we will not be able to, to fulfill the energy demand. And now we are at the point of, of the climate crisis, if we agree on this. And then we have to say, it's, we are again at the point, this technology is different than other technologies, than all other energy uh, technologies, which are, which are able to be switched on and off. It is more compared, it's in somewhere in between this wonderful world of, of wind and solar, on the one hand, high energy, but, but much higher energy density. So there are opportunities. So from this point of view, but uh, let's see the future who was right. Uh, maybe nuclear is the wrong way. Uh, yes, uh, then I agree in this, but uh, I think it's currently the only answer uh, to tackle the, the climate crisis seriously, since the German way is not sustainable. To flood the European market with wind electricity and destroy the market of others uh, for free. And on the other hand, when there is no wind to massively buy electricity from somebody else who maybe could need it too, this is not, this is not a good approach in my view. That's point number one. No, Scott reminded me to the other ones. <laughs> uh, what were the other ones? Um, well, the, I mean, the, the first one was about um, if political will is determined by popular support. Um, that, that's an interesting that's idea, a, that's but interesting. I've practiced that for a while in the United States. That is a very interesting point, you're right. So you, you had the exa example of gun control, yes. I think uh, when there is there are extreme lobbies, extremely powerful lobbies, uh, then you can you can deliver things which are maybe not in the public interest. That is that is right. 
I think NRA is an extreme example, but uh, in some times, uh, nuclear had the same feeling in Germany that uh, that it's only a small minority which has got a massive influence. This is what happens with, with modern media. It will get even worse, I think. Uh, the more uh, outreach private persons with much money can have, the more we will fall into these traps. Uh, I think we can't, this we can't avoid. But you're you're right in this, but um, I think in, in major governmental decisions, which... Uh, I think yeah, all that we need is great politicians, <laughs> you know, and excellent leaders. We have great scientists and engineers. <laughs> yeah, America's going to help with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think just if, if I can, I think there's a general need for um, just an acceptance of uncertainty in general in like popular discourse. Um, I, I don't know, I, I feel like that's kind of necessary before we can really see the benefits of this kind of thing. Uh, and like the big example for me would be, um, I know it's not related to nuclear but for example um jeremy corbyn's seven out of ten for his rating of the eu and that in the public was seen as that's a worthless useless statement it's i think like we can we can communicate uncertainty about like the benefits of these technologies and things but there's still we have to reckon with the fact that the culture we operate in at the moment might not be quite at the point where it's ready to accept and handle those uncertainties. But I think as scientists and engineers, you, we kind of, it, it feels like the, the best thing to do would to at least be yeah honest and open with the uncertainties we're dealing with, even if, but then, yeah, pra practically. It's not so much the uncertainty in nuclear. It is much more the risk. It's people always think, with nuclear, they think about Chernobyl. They think about Fukushima. That is, that is much more the point, I think. So they think about these massive accidents. And in my view, there is there is a there is a core point. Uh, if if we are able uh, to to design a system which uh, which eliminates this this massive thing, I think it's easier to communicate since uh, that that is at least what I have very often what I have very often heard is people see this and they see no plan for the waste. That is the second problem people see. In this country, they are a bit more relaxed, but if you go to Central Europe, you will see the, the argument of uh, no plan about the waste. These are, uh, these are points which are, I think, more than the uncertainties. And, to be honest, uh, the the operation of, of nuclear power plants and 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 the operational performance doesn't doesn't give us um, uh, the the fear of 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 the that there is too much uncertainty. It is, it is really these these maximum risk events which seem to be, in my view. Which is which is massively influencing uh, the. So you're saying that the correct. Uh, so you're saying that the correct design for a fission uh, reactor would be fusion. Is that effectively what you're saying? No, no, definitely not. <laughs> De definitely not. No, but it, so it's the still... problem and the and the problem. You know, the problem problem. How are you going to do that in fission? Uh, I think it's you can if if you decide smart you can you can eliminate almost all all major accident drivers, and 
this is the when you have no accident drivers then you will you can still get an accident but you will not when you don't have the potential to 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 shoot the things to the moon uh, then it gets much it gets much easier to control what's going on and i think there is there is a there is a huge potential which is which is not not used in the moment and there there is what we where we should where we should come to but in general i'm not sure and it will take as much time uh, to explain the people that this is that that we are there and uh, that that this is a key to eliminate these these massive events that these massive events are it's hard to say but people believe in germany they are influenced by fukushima yes they are but only in one form they are living in a much more dirty environment due to the nuclear phase off that is the consequence but people don't see it people don't see people dying for example due to air pollution from coal fire power plants so this is this is just the thing which is which is going slowly which is which is which is not really visible you, it's the same as as you could say the same as cancer risk from from radiation it's always the point when somebody it, it's almost impossible to to find a direct correlation and, and the absolute proof since at the end it's a statistical process i think scott it's also a matter of what else could we do i mean you know the only other source of energy as dense or maybe not as dense but also very dense is hydro but there are no rivers in this country so what could we do to provide because that's the, the other key point of all this we need to provide them in the next decades 60 gigawatts of installed capacity you know for this country i'm sure the french the largest, the largest solar plants that i know are in spain yeah are three and have three and, and tend to have 300 megawatts of installed capacity but that implies using 20 squared miles of land as opposed to one squared mile required by a nuclear power plant if you divide the 60 gigawatts by the num you know by the energy provider you get the number of power plants of solar power plants that you would need i mean does that sound achievable i mean like we would need hundreds of them you know it's, so i i would like to interfere on this point because we're going back to the question scott um raised before what about the belief systems and the public all over the world so where what what makes them driven to decide we are pro or contra for one technology oh, and the thing, what is, the thing is we don't want to crash into the problem we want to solve you know possible problems because before they happen in this case so the problem is what happens if we don't do anything and we suddenly get into massive electricity cuts all along the country i mean then it will take a couple of years to get to, you know, the nuclear power plants built and we'll be suffering those cuts for many years instead of tackling the problem from the, be the very beginning and not suffer any of those cuts. That's what, how I see it at least. Yeah, but it's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting point from Scott. Um, this, at the end, I fear and <laughs> Scott has, has brought it to a really interesting point. Uh, risk communication should be an opportunity to give the people what they what they need for their understanding. And this is very this is very important. And this can be very different. It is very different. And if I give presentation, uh, I try to take that every presentation down to when I go for for audience where I have no nuclear specialist at all, up to speaking at conferences where you have only nuclear specialists, and you have to you have to tailor your information. That is that is very very often very important, and it's 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 things like the the bottle of campaign example, which gives the people a little bit of feeling, and that is I think 
a very, very important thing that we as engineers, as, as scientists, try to keep the people on board as long as they are interested. Sometimes the people say, okay, that's too complicated. That's okay. That's okay. But as long as they are interested, we should keep them, we should, we should keep them and we should try to feed them on a, on, on a level which is, a, which, is, which is tailored for them. That is, that, is a, that is a very important thing for me. But uh, I think at the end, it is a question, and this is, sounds really dumb, but it's a, it's a question of, do you believe that nuclear will be the solution to deliver for the UK or not? And uh, this is a point I, even I can't answer. And uh, that sounds now maybe strange, but um, you don't know what happens on the way. That's one thing. And even if you go with a perfect system, with a perfect approach in, uh, it can happen that uh, you destroy it on the game by, for example, having a bad design. So you, you never know this. But uh, I would say I have a, I have a 95% perception that we can deal with it with a new technology which can solve the waste problem, which can deliver on the fuel use, which can deliver on a reasonable cost without having this massive pre-investment of everything what we have promised of the closed fuel cycle. Nuclear has always promised a closed fuel cycle to burn all the uranium. We have always promised this, but we said in the 50s and 60s, we have to start, and this is the step now, open fuel cycle, fuel in, burn it once and store it, but we have to get better. We have failed on the way. We have failed on the way since the facilities got so unacceptably expensive that it never got into the area of being economically viable. But that was maybe a result of the approach. The approach has shown that nuclear could do it, but now it's about to design systems which are designed for delivering energy and not plutonium and not nuclear propulsion. And ideally these systems should solve the waste problem in addition. And then we have something which is worth to argue, but it is still, and I'm aware of this, it will be a big argument. I, I would say, uh, Bruno, that you're obviously talking to your audience is, uh, of course, important and essential and critical and everything, but it's nowhere near sufficient to get your point across. It's, it's, a, it's a very different process, and one that I think Elfrida will be able to help you with, um, because it involves not just communication, but engagement uh, and investment by the recipient of your argument in the process. If you can do that, then you start to win minds and influence uh, people. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer. My favorite color is shrink of glow. You, know, I, I, you don't have to convince someone like me, but I don't think that you'll ever win in your lifetime the argument in the public sphere. Uh, that, that argument has been, it's just been lost. Um, it's going to be a generation before you can get them back. Even with, I think, the compelling arguments about carbon, uh, it's just a lost argument. Um, there is a way to win the argument, but it's, uh, it's going to take a long time to implement. So yeah, we had, I think it's too late now. <laughs> no, we had a talk last week from, from a, a lady from public health and what she suggested, and I think this is a really good point, to involve all the communities, first of all, where a facility needs to be created or whatsoever, and these communities um, need to be involved as well with their desire, with their requirements, and they can't be left out as it had been previously, so just build a facility somewhere. That's what works. Yes, and this, this, brings, this brings me to, uh, when, when you think back to what I presented, I said uh, the, um, the operators have given up on, or the, have given up on the technology with these decisions to, to build in France, with the decisions 
to reprocess in US, or in, not in US, in UK and in France. So, and this has, this had another catastrophic consequence. I, I remember that I once intended to go with my children to, to the information center of a nuclear power plant. And I knew the guys and they phoned them and said I would like to come on Saturday. And he said, oh, you're close on Saturday. And they asked him, uh, can you just repeat this? Me? Yeah, we're close on Saturday. On Sunday too. And I said, can you just give me your opening time? And he said, yeah, 10 to 3 o'clock from Monday to Friday. And I said, okay. Then you don't need to speak with or to inform the public anymore in your own information center then you obviously don't want to have this technology anymore. Since instead of delivering the information to the people when they are available, they, when they think they can deliver from, Friday, uh, from, from Monday to Friday between 10 and 3 o'clock the information to people who don't come, this is obviously not the right approach. And this is exactly, this is, this is, another, this is another driver which I see which, which uh, which went wrong in Germany. This was this, this really giving up on the technology. What May I ask, uh, Sebastian, Enrique okay. um, raised his hand already. Okay. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, what if we are, what if we are scoping the problem wrongly? And I mean, so in the German, the German situation, they had to turn on the coal power systems after turning, turning off um, the nuclear power to compensate the, the, the losses. Um, so what if instead of having to generate more power, what we have to do is to lower our consumption of energy? Can we? Yeah, that's... that's the good point, can we easily do it from one day to the other? That is the question you would, you would have to ask. I can give you the perfect example of the country which did it. This is Japan. Japan has closed down all their nuclear power plants. And with the consequence that this country has massively changed. And it has partly changed the culture when you think about meeting Japanese 10 years ago, you would never have met a Japanese without Thai and a, at, any, at any level of business. This culture has changed, but this is a part you can do. So, so they have reduced massively their over climatization they had, especially in the South. So they have, in some part, they have done this job. On the other hand, uh, they still suffer massively from a lack of electricity which leads to product, massive production shortages, which has costed this country hundreds of billions meanwhile. And it's not only this, it's a question how long can you live in this, in this state of exception, like COVID, yes? How long can you live in this? And how long are the people willing, for example, what is done in Japan still is, that some high electricity demand technologies, the companies just work during the night time and they, they don't work during daytime. So this is all, these are all the consequences. You have to go then, and it's a question, is a society willing to go this way? This is, this, is a, this is a decision which has to be taken. I think if Germany would have made the decision to phase out without compensating the electricity production by coal-fired plants, maybe uh, the politicians would not have been able to go through the phase out decision. Since uh, people are happy to do something and to go forward, but you know by yourself when it starts with uh, degrading your own quality of life, then you look much more critical on things before you say yes.
you, you think it's easier to convince people um, that nuclear is safe uh, than to convince people to lower their quality of life. Well, if we say this is quality of life. Um, that's a, that's a, no, I haven't said this, sorry. <laughs> but that's, it's a, no, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant point. These are the, these are the points. Then you see people turn to things like electricity supply to see them as God given. Electricity comes out of the socket when you plug in. When this starts not to work anymore, then people will look onto things completely different. It's, it's, uh, you see, it's like having a car or having no car. As long as it doesn't influence my life, as long as I live in, in a surrounding where I have a perfect public transport, like we have here, 10 minutes walk, I never use the car to go to university. It is different and then you don't come away from your place when you don't have a car. And then people have a different recognition. And I think this is, it's the same as long as electricity is available in an unlimited amount, people want to have it at the, at the lowest possible risk. And they have identified maybe that nuclear is, is an unacceptable risk. But I, I will just put this back to, to a very famous Indian thinker the head of the Indian nuclear program, uh, Homi uh, Baba, who said, no energy is much more dangerous than no energy. To have no energy supply is much more dangerous than, than all technologies we use to produce electricity. Since he said people die simply in India due to having, for example, no fridge and eating low quality food out of this. It's much more risk. So having no energy, no electricity is, is a much, much bigger problem than any risk produced by any electricity production technology. On the other hand, I have once uh, in the discussion brought the point where somebody said, are you allowed to cite? I'm allowed to cite this. He says, yes, just cite it. When you dig it a hole in the ground, into the ground, dirt will come out full stop. So any technology to produce energy requires somehow to dig a hole into the ground. If it's coal, if it's, if it's uranium, if it's, if it's oil, if it's, if it's noble metals and, and, and rare earth for producing solar, solar cells, it, it always ends up with the same. Every technology ends up in you cause disruption and you cause dirt. You can't avoid this. And when we don't accept this basic rule, then it gets hard. But we have to ask maybe the question, which technology produces the lowest level or the best to control the level of dirt? This is a question which is very important to look into detail. Thank you, Bruno. Yeah, thank we, you. I think that, that was the key, actually. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Uh, we are almost within a two-hour <laughs> presentation and discussion. I think if there's no urgent question right now, we will close this meeting. Uh, and thank you very much for um, answering so in-depth and being challenged by some questions as well. <laughs> And I think you will be happy if someone goes more in, deeper in contact with you, you are happy to uh, help out or answer any questions in addition. Definitely, yes. And to be honest, I enjoyed it very much to have an interested audience. Uh, being able to discuss interesting things is always, I think this is what we need much more to be successful. Yeah, yeah. so thank you for the audience as well, for the questions and a uh, really deep interest in it. Yeah. And thank, thank you for yeah. organizing. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for for the presentation. Really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a good weekend, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Yep. Same Cheers to you. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Everyone. Bye bye. Be safe. Bye. Bye. Have a good night.